Hello, my name is uh, Richard Haldeman. I'm responsible for sustainability transformation at Clarion. And uh, over the next 15 minutes or so, I would like to uh, introduce you to how Clarion is driving performance with uh, safe and sustainable by design products and approaches. Uh, I'd first like to uh, thank you all for joining this uh, this session, and uh, I would like a special th give a special thanks to Eka that has invited us to present our journey here. So, for those of you who uh, don't know uh, Clarion yet, Clarion is a global leader in specialty chemicals with a very broad portfolio serving very many different uh, markets across the globe. We've categorized uh, these uh, markets into three different areas, into care chemicals, catalysts, and natural resources. And over the past few years, we have really noticed that in all of these different areas, sustainability is increasingly driving customer behavior as well as market dynamics, albeit maybe with different emphasis and also with different speeds. So, for example, in care chemicals, customers are really looking for um, the overall sustainable solution with maybe a focus on safety of the chemicals. In catalysts, the markets are increasingly being driven by the need to lower their carbon footprint. And in natural resources, we're seeing a strong push towards circularity, particularly in the, in the plastics industry. Now, we believe that this shift towards sustainability is both desirable as well as necessary if we're really going to be successful in this journey towards a sustainable future. So we also believe that those companies that are at a forefront for enabling this transition are going to really benefit from this, uh, from this trend. And so already a few years back, we decided to integrate sustainability in our strategy with the strategic pillar number two, add value with sustainability. And of course, we've also added a number of uh, challenging targets with regards to our carbon footprint, with science-based targets, and we've committed to contributing to the UN sustainability development goals. But what we've really determined is that sustainability on its own is not going to really make the difference. We need to bring the first two pillars together, focus on innovation and R&D and sustainability. And we've determined that these two pillars are essentially two sides of the same coin. And if you're really going to drive sustainability and create value out of that, you need to bring these two pillars together. So how are we doing this? We have integrated sustainability, hardwired sustainability, into a product development process. What you see here is, is our innovation process called the idea to market process. And from an early stage, we really already have sustainability in, integrated. Uh, we use sustainability and policy trends and sustainability trends to identify opportunities to start an ideation. And then already very early on, when we're looking at potential solutions, we do an in silico screening for the toxicity of these products, making sure that we're going to identify products that have a high likelihood of being toxic already very early on, so we don't follow these, up, uh, these leads. And then once we have sort of high level designs of these products, we go in and we do a thorough sustainability screening. We call it the PVP R&D because it's not as detailed as the final screening, but it allows us to uncover hotspots, sustainability hotspots in these developing products so that the R&D community can make sure that they're going to address these when they finally um, develop the product. Before the commercialization, we could do a full sustainability screening um, so that we can ensure that the products are really sustainable um, or that we really have a sustainability leading product. And then if that's the case, the project teams can apply for an Ecotain uh, label for their product, showing that their products really set a 
sustainability standard in their respective market segments. So maybe just a few words to the sustainability screening. It's at such a pivotal point. And, and here, unfortunately, um, there's no shortcuts. Uh, we have found out, and we've been actually one of the forerunners in, in, in uh, these sustainability screenings. We developed our so-called portfolio value program already in 2012, together with uh, external non-governmental organizations. Um, and we have set up a process that looks at the entire life cycle of the product, looks at the impact of the products on the planet, on people, on society, and compares the performance attributes of the products to X best alternatives. And that creates then a screening process with 36 different criteria. And um, we have not been able to uh, simplify this uh, substantially, actually, we are currently in the revision of this process to stay a step ahead of what we see as new legislation coming, new policies coming. Um, and so we believe that we're going to stick with around 36 criteria, but we're not going to be able to, to reduce this. So the take home message here is that you need to have this holistic screening, particularly to ensure that you have no regrettable um, substitutions, that you're not creating a product that is performing better in one area of sustainability, but really is lowering your performance in another. So I would like to show how this works with uh, two concrete examples. The first one here is on, on braking fluids and uh, just a little bit of, of background on braking fluids so you understand what it's about. Braking fluids are really high tech, high quality specialty um, uh, chemicals. They need to comply with the highest uh, quality standards, obviously, because they're such a vital part of, of uh, making sure that you, when you press the brakes, that you actually stop the car. Um, there's different categories of brake fluids. They're called DOT3, DOT4, DOT5, uh, which essentially give sort of a, a performance rating. Now, if you have an anti-lock braking system, and most of the cars nowadays have, you're going to require a DOT4 category braking fluid. Now, in order to maintain the performance of this braking fluid throughout the life cycle of that braking fluid, uh, you're going to, uh, the industry has, has um, added a, um, an ingredient and it's called borate ester. These borate esters ensure that the performance of the brake fluid um, remains very high in the use phase. The problem is that borate esters are a class two reprotoxic uh, material. And so you have a hazardous material to start out with and then over the life cycle of the, of the use of, of the brake fluid, they're hydrolyzed to form free borates and free borates are a class one reprotoxic compound. And so you generate um, hazardous waste. Now this means that you have special protection measures that need to take place when you're changing the braking fluids. You have hazardous waste that you need to take care of. And so we decided that, you know, this really would be um, something that is worth taking a look at and seeing if we can improve this. And so we set out to redesign um, our uh, the brake fluids that, that, that we were selling. And we came up with um, a new line. It's called Safe Brake Life. Uh, it is the first CMR free um, CMR label free DOT4 brake fluid. And while we were already redesigning it, making sure that we're going to meet the performance attributes without the borate esters, we also looked at the other ingredients. And so we ensured that we were using readily biodegradable materials. Uh, we chose ones that have a low carbon footprint. And we ensure that there's no hazardous waste that is generated in the use phase of these materials so that we can overall simplify the handling and 
the disposal process for the brake fluids. Because of all of these sustainability advantages, uh, we awarded this product with an Ecotain label as being a sustainability leader in the class of, uh, of brake fluids. It's now on the market. If you have a process like this in place, you can do this again and again and again for different for different um, processes. So the, the 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 second and last example that I want to share with you is is one that is uh, um, addressing the challenge of microplastics. We have a broad portfolio of different uh, additives. Uh, actually, they're coatings, and we use them for very different applications. Now it turns out that these these coatings are not readily biodegradable. They're not biodegradable at all, actually. And uh, for certain applications, for example, for seed coatings, um, you coat the seeds, need to perform, you put them into the earth, but you don't have a biodegradable polymer. So you will be generating or potentially generating microplastics. And we see the policy trends really going into a direction where we're going to see a lot of restrictions for introducing microplastics into the environment. And so we set out to say, OK, how are we going to um, design new coatings that are both compatible with the requirements that we have in the market, but also biodegradable? And what we came up with is this Lycocare RBW Vita. RBW stands for rice bran wax because we found that a side product, a side stream of the rice bran wax production that is not used for anything else, so it's not um, actually competing with any food chain, uh, is capable upon upgrading to actually substitute a lot of our petro-based uh, non-biodegradable uh, coatings. And so we have been able to introduce this into many different applications now over the past 12 months. Uh, have been able to get for most of the uh, the grades an OK compost industrial or OK biodegradable soil label. Uh, and because of these, these benefits, uh, it was also awarded the Ecotain level. Uh, we also got external recognition, um, getting the best sustainable product, the ISIS Innovation Award 2020, as well as the gold level material health certificate. So, Again, if you can just apply the, the, this, this knowledge about the sustainability um, into your product development process, you can repeat this in many different applications and for many different products. So this brings me already to the summary, and, and I just want to make three points. Systematically integrating sustainability into your product development process really helps you to drive a transition of your portfolio towards greater sustainability. Now, a word of caution, if you want to go down that path and substitute products with products that have higher sustainability, you need to have a holistic life cycle based analysis of the sustainability of your products in order to ensure that you're not going to have regrettable substitutions. Also, you should be trying to use as much as possible scientific data to compare the sustainability in the different dimensions with alternative solutions. And then finally, if we're going to be successful in this journey towards a sustainable future, it's going to be mandatory that we all engage both with policymakers as well as the broader uh, stakeholder community about the sustainability uh, um, challenges that we have. And this is particularly important because sometimes in the details of policies that are well intentioned, um, you see unintended consequences that actually favor regrettable substitutions. And here we need to engage with policymakers to make them aware of this and also to propose how we might have more robust legislation for these different and very disparate challenges that we see across the many industries. So thank you very much for your attention, and I look very much forward to receiving your questions.